So, uh, first, before I get started, I want to open with a recognition, as one does in this neck of the woods, uh, that we are guests on unceded Aboriginal territory, and to humbly thank the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh nations for their great patience with us. So I'm here today because in the world of information architecture, and indeed the world, uh, I still see curiously a lot of this. And by this, I mean strict hierarchies of disjoint sets. And I don't see nearly as much as I would expect of this. That's And if I was going to diagnose it, I would uh, turn over to Mr. McLuhan. And uh, what he warned us all about, which is when a new medium shows up, uh, we still use it in terms of the old one. So I submit that the computer, being what it is, has made it take unusually long for culture to use it on its own terms as an expressive medium. Uh, of course, uh, it would be absurd for me to claim that there are no examples of using the medium of the computer to do things other than simulating the media that preceded it. Uh, there are plenty. My own interest, however, is in comprehension. The comprehension of structures uh, that, of information that do not behave like nice ordered trees. You know, and we can see some evidence of that. These are examples ranging from more to less what I'm talking about. Incidentally, how many people remember going to Wikipedia like 10 plus 15 maybe years ago and being really weirded out that there are no categories and they kind of like showed up a little bit later and they're kind of secondary objects? Uh, so these structures of these systems, I mean, they are at this point at the local level something people definitely set out to do, but at the grand scale, they kind of just evolve. And I submit that they're kind of primitive compared to what could be accomplished if an alternative method of structuring information was being consciously considered. And so the question I'm asking is, in 2017, or rather it is 2017, where is my hypertext utopia? So uh, I'll begin by introducing two concepts. Uh, we have extension, which is the term for how we're used to thinking about categories. Uh, if, an, if a set is just a category, then extension is everything inside the category. And then we have intention, which is the semantic content, the meaning of whatever attribute is being used to label uh, a given set. So if a set is a category, a category is a section in a phone book, uh, then last name begins with A is a predicate that has some meaning. And this meaning is the intention. So unsurprisingly, intention is the inverse of extension. And intention is not nothing to do with intent or intention or wanting to do things. And it has very, very little to do with the philosophical concept intentionality, which is aboutness, or my understanding of it rough translated. Uh, it's spelled differently. It has a different path through curiously the same root. And I should underscore that these concepts are for you, not your users. Uh, the purpose is int of introducing them is to put them into context. And we'll need at least a couple layers of translation on top of this to uh, make the distinction more accessible uh, to the greater public. So I submit that a lot of information architecture reduces to, or should I say, from outside pressure, it degenerates into uh, establishing extensions creating buckets with labels and putting things into them. Consider the venerable latch, location, alphabet, time, category, hierarchy, or as I like to call it, category, 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 category. <laughs> or equivalently, we can say extension, 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 extension. And the only difference between any of these elements is the intention, the semantic relation, which when paired with a value creates a predicate, a true or false test, which defines the extension. Alphabet, for example, is just a list of categories where the predicate is value starts with the letter x. Uh, time is similar. Value occurs with an interval x. 
Category is a total cop-out because the predicate can literally be anything. Value of arbitrary semantic relation is x. And hierarchy is also a bit of a cheat in this meta-categorization scheme because it amounts to just putting categories inside other categories. It's the same as performing a logical and on multiple predicates where each predicate defines a proper subset of the one that came before it. So alphabetical categorization, first letter of the value is x and second letter of the value is y. You get the picture. Uh, indeed, location is the only one of these which we can say is slightly different, and it's different in the case of geographical coordinates. And the difference there is that it's two or three possibly perpendicular dimensions instead of one. Uh, one dimension for all the other atch. So latch makes a lot of sense for when you're dealing with information technology from the beginning of human civilization until about 50 years ago. Uh, indeed, it still makes a lot of sense for things up to the present and beyond. I mean, Wurman didn't formalize the term latch until what, the late 1980s? Is that right, Dan? Uh, so that's like 40 years into the computer era. But I submit that before the computer, going beyond latch was not only far from expedient, it would have been borderline inconceivable. So uh, when I say information-bearing medium, I'm thinking about a kind of ensemble. Uh, for each type of information we're interested in, we've got the media that store it, the media that transport it, and the media that operate over it. But information media that predate the computer all share the same geometric and topological constraints, which translate into physical and economic constraints. And it's because of this fact that up until the computer, extension was the only affordable and only workably meaningful way to organize information. Analog media, which I don't really like the term, but it's sticky, uh, find themselves all bound up the following ways. First is orientability. This is a distinct and well-defined upness, downness, backness, frontness, leftness, rightness, beforeness, afterness, etc. So this means that binary relations like less and more or cardinality can be, uh, or before and after, ordinality, uh, can be mapped easily onto this space. The next constraint is planarity or near planarity. This is the tendency for relations between entities to not cut across each other or at worst, they do so very little. This is closely related to hierarchy as all trees are planar, but not all planar structures are trees. You can see this is the uh, Königsberg Bridge, which is the original Illyrian path problem uh, in mathematics. Um, the sort of seven bridges of Königsberg, you try to get from one part of the city to the other without going crossing a bridge twice. The other one is the Shield of the Trinity. Uh, that is an artifact. I think it's like 1,500 years old. Um, but you, know, you can tell with these things that people were thinking about you know, non-strictly hierarchical structures, which is why I, I chose them. The next thing we have is containment and mariology, and this is the tendency for smaller entities to fit fully inside of or be an identifiable part of larger entities. The next constraint is packing and tiling. So in Euclidean space, only objects with threefold, fourfold, or sixfold symmetry can tile. Uh, the favorite, ostensibly, is the fourfold. This is from the Alhambra. That's my girlfriend's butt. Um, the, <clears throat> the, uh, she's going to be mad. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the fourfold symmetry is a favorite because it's got a sort of before and after uh, perpendicularity uh, goodness to it. And then the last constraint is the transformations. So predating the computer, information bearing media only undergo a handful of transformations to get the information onto or off of them. Uh, speech is transformed to text through a cognitive process, then transformed into a two-dimensional strip with unit height, which is then segmented and stacked onto a plane. If you wanted to add microfilm, you could add a scaling operation to that. 
figurative images are initially projected from three dimensions to two, uh, like Mr. Durer is uh, demonstrating here, uh, either by a co another cognitive or a photographic process. Uh, in the latter case, there's a, there's a scaling operation there when this, the image is scaled down for storage onto film and back up again for printing. Schematic images such as maps and blueprints are likewise subjected to projections and linear transformations. Analog signal processing of audiovisual media entails applying convolutions, Fourier transforms, that's that, uh, et cetera, to store and retrieve information. So in analog media, uh, transformations are ostensibly expensive and limited only to a handful of operations. Indeed, the analog in analog is referring exactly to these few transformations. So the cost and nature of analog transformations means there's a stiff constraint on the lower bound of material. So type can only get so small before it's impossible to handle, let alone read. Even with magnification help, feature size is constrained by the propensity of ink to bleed into paper. Halide crystals in photographic film can only encode features of a certain size, and this is why fast film is grainy. It has bigger crystals, which are more sensitive. Uh, audio tape and motion picture film recordings are called footage for a reason. And what this leads to is very large basic units uh, and even larger logical units. So consider text. The basic physical unit is the page. The basic logical unit is the document. You can write and mail a one-page letter, but you can't just publish a one-page document. You're constrained economically to create an entire book, or at least find a magazine or anthology that will publish your document. But what's the basic semantic unit? That is the sentence. Scissors notwithstanding, you need an entire page to store one sentence. In computer land, we call this protocol overhead. Moreover, how the hell would you publish just one sentence? And don't say take an ad out in the newspaper, please. So can you even do that still? <laughs> so we have a situation where the basic physical unit of information is considerably bigger than the basic semantic unit. The basic logical unit is even bigger, and the basic economic unit is bigger still. And these constraints dictate the range in size, the range in shape, the range in volume of information, the range in content of semantic relations, and the range in density of connections within and without. The most severe change, the most radical change of any of these ranges probably only amounts to a few orders of magnitude since the first Sumerian clay tablet. So perhaps latch is less of a typology for organizing information and more of a typology for organizing documents. So this segmenting operation going from one degree of dimensions to another is worth some further analysis when we continue to aggregate upward. You get a bunch of these documents together and a reasonable thing to want to do is warehouse them. So you build a building. Now a building is a three-dimensional object, typically a fairly large three-dimensional object, which exists in a system that has gravity, giving buildings a distinct orientation. Uh, we slice this three-dimensional building into floors, yielding a two-dimensional area, or if you're the Seattle Public Library, you just make a spiral. Um, on the floors, we can put shells, which further transform the subset of these three-dimensional space into a one-dimensional segment of linear shelf space. So we've mapped a one-dimensional space onto a physical three-dimensional space. Now what? Well, latch. So the Dewey Decimal System and its descendants do something really remarkable here. You take a segment of the number line from zero to infinitesimally short of a thousand and chop it up into ten equal parts. You assign a these, each of these parts a concept. How you come up with the concepts is something I'm restraining myself from ranting about from the time being. Uh, you can create arbit you've probably heard it already anyway. So you can create arbitrarily fine-grained subdivisions in this conceptual space simply by defining it, or dividing it recursively by ten. Then you can take this whole mess and map it onto your inventory of shelf space in adjusting each category for the aggregate physical width of the documents you have in each one. The individual shelving units in the system mimic the page in a book, which, uh, which each shelf is analogous to a line of text. Each book is a word or letter. Two books with the same number can be given an arbitrary uh, secondary sort alphabetically, first by surname of the author. You know the rest of the drill. So this is pretty impressive. Uh, through a series of metaphors, uh, George Lakoff calls these kinesthetic image schema. 
uh, we have a systematic method of attaching meaning to space. So what we have here, in effect, is an addressing scheme, not like, unlike you'd encounter in any modern city. That is not a modern city, but it looks really cool. You know what else works this way? RAM. So how many of you are familiar with the Turing machine? Imaginary machine, part of a thought experiment, consists of a piece of ticker tape that is infinitely long, and that's why it's imaginary. It's got a reader, writer head, not unlike the mechanism in a tape recorder. Uh, the head can write symbols to spots on the tape and read them back off again. The symbols can instruct the head to do things like move in spots to the left or right and read, write, or erase another symbol. And with this structure, you can simulate any kind of machine, including another Turing machine, which is an incidentally can simulate another Turing machine and so on. And that's what virtualization is. Uh, this is facilitated through the exact same trick of ascribing meaning to elements of the structure through some outside mechanism. So a real computer is a finite metaphorical approximation of an impossible to construct, uh, construct Turing machine. So memory in a computer is like the tape of a Turing machine. And of course, the CPU is the recorder head. And we use the same trick as Dewey. We chop it up into pieces, and we give each piece an address. Then we can say things like, the piece at the given address plus its next however many neighbors represents a number, or a date, or a name, or a sonnet, or John Cage's 433, or whatever. Uh, and with this mechanism of offset and length, location and extent, we have a mechanism of absolute and relative addresses for the basic addressable unit of digital information. The basic addressable unit of digital information is the 8-bit byte. This is a convention. Uh, earlier computers used the word, which we can imagine as the size of a region on the tape that the Turing machine can manipulate at once. So when Intel advertises a 64-bit processor, word size is what they're talking about. Uh, indeed, the fact that the byte is eight bits is also a convention. Some of them were 10. Um, I think some of them were five even, too. It's just the nearest power of two that can encode all the symbols on a typewriter and have one bit left over to ensure that the signal stays aligned. So the point of this laborious excursion is to impress that the units of computers are radically different from the units of information in media that preceded them. But perhaps more important than the absolute change in units is their change relative to each other. So I want to expand briefly on the basic post-computer logical unit, which I'm calling the memory region. So there's a concept in mathematics called a tuple. No doubt some of you are aware. A tuple is a finite ordered list of values. Each element of a tuple can therefore be given a number. The number can therefore be related to a meaning. And this notion has a reification which is called a struct. And you can define a struct in one place and are free to create instance of it, instances of it. And each instance of a struct is a memory region with a distinctive anatomy. And if you know the offset and length of the struct's elements, you can address them directly. So I want to say here there's nothing meta about this data. These are real physical objects. They're just very small. Or rather, the size of the underlying medium tends to be really small. And the modern descendants of the struct are the object, the database table, the XML schema, et cetera. Nowadays, we don't explicitly specify where the parts and pieces reside in memory. The computer does that for us. Uh, so developers work with these objects all the time. DBAs work with these objects all the time. No doubt many of you work with these objects all the time. So my question here is where does the data architecture stop and the information architecture begin? So my argument so far is that planarity in spatially mapped semantic relations, and especially in strict hierarchy, is a byproduct of being constrained by the need to organize space and place physical objects in space where they stay put for when you come back to get them. So with this constraint, an object can't be in two places at once. An object can't sort of be in a container. 
Nevertheless, pre-digital information technology does break planarity in one place, and that is the reference. And since these relations are made of informational information, their traversal is a process, uh, and they can, be in one, they can be in one more place at once, more than one place at once. If you were going to try to draw them, though, you would get a hairball. So references, of course, work by allocating some part of the real estate of a document uh, to the addresses of the same or other documents, often granular to the page or section. And it should be no surprise that we can do the same with computer memory. In addition to having uh, so indeed a computer wouldn't do much if we didn't, because putting memory addresses uh, into other segments of memory is precisely how uh, a computer uh, knows what to do next. So in addition to having an arbitrary fraction of your computer's memory pointed to other parts of itself, you can also have arbitrarily many pointers to the same region uh, in memory, uh, enabling you to reuse it. So the principle of addressing and referencing is pervasive in hardware and software architecture. You see it within running programs in the inodes that underpin the file systems as well as the file structure itself. And I even hear tell there was a kind of standardized identifier out there for information resources that is uniform. Whereas the general dereferencing process is significantly costly pre-computer, it's such an integral part of post-computer life, most of the time you don't even know that's what's going on. So I'd like to consider the following process. Okay, you've all done academic research. You know this is a pain in the ass. Uh, but if the fact that it's a pain in the ass is not the point. My point is that this process represents one path through an information finding process, one of many possible paths. So my observation here is that when the units are big and the dereferencing process is expensive, you simply can't afford as many paths connecting them this way. And so the fact that a computer is digital is not especially interesting. Text is digital. You know, uh, it always has been. Semiosis is digital. Um, and the fact that a computer is electronic is slightly more interesting, but only incidentally, because it just means the information-bearing medium uh, is about as cheap as you can get. After all, you can make a computational medium out of just about anything. It just happens that electrons are about the cheapest currently on offer for now. Um, but perhaps the most remarkable thing about the kind of computers we use is random access. Any memory dereferencing operation costs just about the same as any other. And since transfers to and from persistent storage uh, and networks operate on the same principles, uh, they also cost about the same as each other, though in proportion of the size of the transfer. So that is to say that any segment of size x is going to cost roughly the same as any other segment of size x. So when your ISP brags about bandwidth, this is what they're talking about. And you guys all know this. Um, so once again, I submit that the economics of our space have radically changed. And to date, I still don't see a heck of a lot of evidence that we're really, really taking advantage of it, at least not really as much as we could. So analog information architecture, let's call it, looks a lot like the digital process of serialization. Uh, serialization is what you have to do to store live computer data in a pers persistent medium or move it across a network. Uh, in designing serialization, uh, you have to decide precise rules for how to take apart complex informational structures. So non-planar links between elements get cut into refer reference pairs. Hierarchies get smeared out end to end. Uh, otherwise, unordered groups of objects are given definite sequences according to some rule. Elements themselves are normalized into consistent literal representation. And the result is reified somehow uh, as a file or network message. This is subsequently encoded in a physical medium. The reverse process, which is parsing, is worth contemplating briefly. Some quantity of physical stuff exhibits patterns of contrast. The contrast patterns are mapped onto known elementary entities. Let's just call this a byte stream. Uh, the stream is coagulated into lexical tokens of varying length. 
called a token stream. Uh, the grammar rules are applied to the token stream to give them a hierarchical structure called a parse tree or syntax tree, uh, just like in linguistics. And then semantics got applied to the parse tree by the execution context, including potentially semantics, which came along for the ride, and we get the full structure and all its arbitrary complexity. I look at this process and I can't help but see an analogy between it and the information uh, finding process I just described, or indeed the ordinary act of reading. Uh, in the latter, the execution context is your mind. We analyze this kind of process explicitly for getting things, specific things done, and as is the case of, say, like a user journey. Uh, but how often do we consider this kind of analysis for the aim of gaining comprehension? How often do we think about assembling a mental model inside a user's mind? And here we get to the thing that uh, put me onto this inquiry in the first place. The book is called Notes on the Synthesis of Form, published in 1964 by Christopher Alexander. It's an adaptation of his PhD thesis. The thesis is about the meta problem of design problems, namely that a design problem is a hairball of interacting concerns. This is actually from the book. And since the way to solve any complex problem is to break it apart recursively until you have a plurality of problems that each are small enough to manage, there is a distinct meta-meta problem of making sure you cut where the joints are. The meta-meta problem looks like this. What you're after is what architects call a program, a hierarchically structured set of tasks which you can follow to produce a result. What you have is a constellation of design concerns uh, which are connected together arbitrarily densely by a symmetric relation that can be pronounced roughly like interacts with. So your task is to turn this hairball into an orderly tree. So you say, no problem, this is a job for a taxonomy. To which Alexander says, not so fast, because your constraint is that you have to cut as few of these links as possible because each severed link means a potential flaw in the finished design. So Alexander asks, what is your guarantee that your topology of concepts is going to come at all close to matching the topology of the design concerns? Try as you might to construct disjoint subsets of elements under labels like acoustics or neighborhood or safety, he argues, is bound to leave some elements straddling two or more categories and a misc category for the remaining elements that don't fit in any other category at all. How do you prove a claim like that? Let's imagine, Alexander writes, that we're designing a tea kettle. So let's say that this tea kettle, we've identified 21 design concerns, and for each of these concerns is attached at least one, but on average, many more than one other concern. Well, by theorem, there are two to the 21, or 2,097,512 ways to partition that 21 elements set. But the core English language only has about 650,000 terms only. So that's only about a 30% coverage of the possible partitioning schemes. So there's a feeble chance that a set of terms that match the partitioned subjects, subsets, leaving completely aside that the chance of the topology of the partitioning scheme will match the topology of the semantic relations between the terms. So if this is the case for a 21 element system, you know, what about much more complex systems with hundreds or thousands of design concerns? In other words, the hierarchical decomposition of an arbitrary graph structure based on a predetermined taxonomy is almost certain to be suboptimal. So it occurred to me at the time that if this problem exists, here, it could very well exist on a website. So uh, this is the IA Institute. Uh, this is a content inventory of the IA Institute site when I was on the board uh, for a few years ago, so it's old. Um, the decomposition here uh, is not the same as the structure of the, uh, of the sections. So what's going on in this, in this image? There's not really much of a point in zooming into it. Uh, but uh, the elements that are colored 
uh, and the sets that, that were generated through an automated partitioning, uh, just a modularity class process, uh, were, do not match up one to one to the sections of the website. So that's kind of an interesting phenomenon. So the idea here is that we perhaps could use uh, topological analysis in our creation of categories. It would probably help us create better categories. And incidentally, this is more or less what artificial intelligence is doing. It's using uh, mathematical, uh, mathematical methods to partition sets of things. But it's also coming up with its own predicates. And these predicates don't mean anything to anybody else but the artificial intelligence. So what that means is you have a bunch of stuff split up into a bunch of subsets and you have no idea what the partitioning criterion is. So I'm near the end here. Um, I submit that uh, there's only few widely recognized kinds of intentional relations in the world of documents. A lot of them pertain to provenance, and the rest are spatially uh, derived, so they're kinesthetic image schema. Uh, indeed, we can say that a particular, uh, particular spatial arrangement of semantic content is exactly what a document is. But the fundamental information retrieving operation on a computer is dereference. And the question is, dereference what? Uh, you know, what is the meaning of the reference? So in the, in the pre-computer era, all relations are uh, spatial or they're cognitive processes. So, of course, the answer is ontologies, but I need more than just ontologies myself. I want to use other people's well-researched ontologies. I want to invent my own terms and concepts when necessary. Uh, and I want to be able to publish them so that the terms and concepts of people, other people can use them. And the, the duh obvious uh, thing to use is the uh, semantic web, or rather linked data, split hairs. So uh, in the talk uh, abstract, uh, I promised you guys a, uh, I was going to do a bunch of stuff uh, with some uh, site forensics. I did not have the several hundred hours I needed to make that happen. So I'm going to show you some other thing instead. So this is like an application that I'm working on. Uh, this is a structured argumentation tool. Uh, and it uses, it's basically like a thin skin over uh, effectively semantic web data. Uh, you have three classes of item. They are uh, the issue, which is just the thing that needs to be done or steered around. The position, which is what to do about it. And the argument, why you should or why you shouldn't. Um, and again, this is something that is, it's actually describing itself. This is a, uh, uh, IBIS is a, a thing that uh, was invented by a couple management consultants in the 70s, and they were doing it on index cards. There's a, a bunch of stuff out there. There's a lot of attempts to do it uh, uh, with, um, uh, digitize it, obviously. Going back to the 80s, there's a guy called Conklin that does it. Um, however, uh, I found that they were very limiting in their capacity to, um, their capacity to, uh, I guess, they were in a box. They're basically in a, in a, in a um, they were in a, like a, effectively hermetically sealed off from the rest of the planet. So I had to make my own. Uh, and uh, again, this thing is just a, a little thin skin around some, some linked data. The practical effects of using it uh, there's an ontology that I made that, uh, that implements this. It's open source, it's online, and we can talk about it later. Uh, and uh, the, the structure, I suppose, is not really something that even is amenable to, uh, to, to hierarchical structure. There are some. These blue links, for example, are generalizes, specializes, which are just like broader, narrower. Uh, but a lot of it is like nonlinear. 
Uh, so this is sort of something that uh, I threw together uh, really just to try out this IBIS thing. Um, and if you want to talk about it later, we can. But that's all I got for you. So, well, I can do questions. I wasn't planning on that. Ah, you're not on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that was just like one example of like stuff that can be made. Um, and I kind of flood, like I kind of fudged it. <laughs> the, so the, this, this thing like is really, I mean, and part of it is, is kind of like a complement to sort of agile stuff, really. It's kind of like a bug tracker for everything. Um, but it really is like, there's about five or six like different experiments going on here right uh, at the same time. And um, like, for instance, the elements in the insets are semantic relations in the actual data itself. Uh, and uh, it's really just sort of like built around just like raw data. I mean, I can even show you the raw data. Like, you know, this is the guts of the entire thing. It's, um, and really this is just about like 1,200 lines of code or something like that on top of that. So um, really, you know, when you make an ontology, um, so if I go to, I wasn't going to show this, but you make an ontology, it's a document just like any other document. It just happens to be also machine readable. If you, you, you know, you're, the thing about semantic web or slash linked data stuff is you want to actually structure, you want to be able to create terms that, you know, that mean something that you understand as opposed to uh, say, uh, you know, just here's some stuff that, that the machine is sort of oracular, Delphic Oracle has decided that this is a, a thing that you might want to, you know, people bought this, also bought, or whatever, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, this is just like one, you know, one of many arbitrarily many millions, billions of terms. Like there's, you know, there are ontologies, of course, there's psych, there's uh, sumo, uh, but, and there's schema.org, of course, where uh, it's a central, you know, central repository of terms. Uh, versus, again, like having a decentralized position. Um, but yeah.